Welcome back to Bio 43 Pathophysiology Lecture 5. Still in Mechanisms of Cell Injury, but now we're talking about nutritional imbalances and cell death. Nutritional imbalances are pretty straightforward. We can have cell damage from either having too much of a good thing or bad, or too little nutrients. For example, having an excess of calories or saturated fats on a regular basis can lead to many conditions, including obesity atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and cancer. As an illustration of just one of these conditions, look at the GIF of the artery forming an atherosclerotic plaque due to having too much cholesterol floating around in the blood. But also notice that in the drawing in the upper right portion of the slide that there is a tear in the artery wall that allows these plaques to form and get a good grip on the arterial wall. Keep in mind that these tears are thought to be mainly caused by alcohol and cigarette use, as well as free radical damage. This, I believe, is probably why, at least this point in time, researchers have not been able to show a direct link between high cholesterol and heart disease due from atherosclerosis. There are just too many variables to account for. But don't get me wrong, still take your statin medicines prescribed if you have high cholesterol, the theory is sound, so researchers will probably prove it someday. As far as nutritional deficiency goes, a good example is anemia. We will have a section on anemias later on in the course, but vitamin B12 and iron deficiency are some of the major causes of anemia. Other notable causes of nutritional deficiencies that cause cellular damage is scurvy from vitamin C deficiency, beriberi from thiamine deficiency, pellagra from niacin deficiency, all vitamins, and the protein calorie insufficiencies like marasmus or quashiorcor that we see in starving children on the TV commercials. So cell death. Most cells have a normal lifespan and the body has numerous mechanisms for regulating cell numbers and eliminating misplaced or non-functional cells. Therefore, fully functional cells may die on their own for no apparent reason or be killed and eliminated purposefully. These processes are genetically predetermined and generally termed apoptosis. Cell death that occurs through apoptosis usually occurs in a scattered temporal and spatial pattern such that the dead cells can be adequately processed and does not cause tissue or organ dysfunction. Rapid, unprogrammed cell death that results from pathological processes tends to occur regionally and overwhelm the body's ability for elimination, thus affecting normal tissue or organ function. As cells die, they progress through a process of cellular dissolution termed necrosis. This process involves autolysis and karyolysis. The process of necrosis varies depending on the tissue type and, in many cases, the type of injury. Therefore, necrotic processes can be subdivided into coagulative, liquefactive, caseous, fat, gangrenous, both wet and dry, and gas gangrene necrosis categories, each of which may indicate the cause and or mechanism of cellular injury. With these various types of necrosis, there are some high yield bullet statements that you should know. I will almost guarantee that I will ask about these on a quiz or a test, but even more importantly, so will your future professors in professional schools. Coagulative necrosis is caused when proteins are denatured and physically changed from their gel-like state to being firm. A good organ to remember coagulative necrosis with is the kidney. It tends to be the result of prolonged ischemia or lack of blood flow or infarction which leads to ischemia. Liquefactive necrosis should trigger you to think about the brain the neurons or glial cells are literally liquefied because these cells are being digested by their own hydrolases. Generally speaking, when something gets in the brain and causes damage, the immune system walls off the destroyed tissue inside of a cyst. Of course, that tissue is now no longer useful, but at least the infection is not spreading. Caseous 
necrosis is frequently described as cheese-like because that's what it looks like when seen on a gross specimen as shown here. Caseous necrosis is a combination of coagulative and liquefactive necroses and you should associate it with pulmonary tuberculosis. Much like the liquefactive necrosis found in the brain, caseous necrosis is the result of the cells disintegrating or denaturing and then being walled off by the immune system. In the lungs, this walled off nodule is called a GON complex, but we'll talk more about that when we revisit, T when we revisit TB in detail later in the course. Fat necrosis is found in the fatty places in the body, like the breast, pancreas, and abdominal structures. Triglycerides release fatty acids when the enzyme lipase acts on them, and the fatty acids are now available to bind with calcium to form soaps. This process is called saponification. Gangrenous necrosis usually occurs in the extremities and it is due to physical injury and trauma. There are two types of gangrene, which are dry gangrene and wet gangrene. Dry gangrene has no bacterial infection, and the tissue appears dry, whereas wet gangrene has bacteria superinfection, and the tissue looks wet. Isn't that pretty? And that's awesome. Okay, this is just an example of a denatured kidney. You can see on the left what a normal kidney looks like with its many cuboidal cells on the left side of the lumen. The microscopic slide on the right just shows destroyed cells that now look more like some type of connective tissue. We'll click through the next few images to see some more examples of these necrotic tissues that we've talked about already. Feel free to pause anytime you want. I'm going to go to the next slide because this is a good comparison table showing the difference between apoptosis, remember, programmed cell death, and necrosis or pathologic cell death. You might want to hit pause here and, and read them over.